He said our lives mean nothing except as a cycle of regeneration, that we are incomprehensibly brief sparks, just as animals are, that we are no more important than they are, no more worthy of life than any living creature, that in our self-importance, in our search for meaning, we have forgotten how to share the planet that gave us life. Charlotte McConaughey, Migrations. And today's guest on the Earth to Humans podcast. to humans. Wake up, wise up, do what you can, individually and together. The very first book I read by today's guest haunted me for weeks after finishing it. I couldn't shake the reality of the near future world that she creates, which feels as terrifying as it is tangible and close, the reality of a world without animals. I knew I had to bring her on the show somehow, and I'm so glad we were able to have today's conversation. Charlotte McConaughey is an Australian author living in Sydney and the mind behind two international best-selling novels, Migrations and Once There Were Wolves. Charlotte's books are sweeping, beautiful, and haunting as they tackle issues related to the frayed and fragile relationship that we humans have to the natural world. Today, we'll discuss both of her latest novels, The Necessity of Empathy and Preserving Hope in the Face of Devastating Ecological and Interpersonal Loss. Charlotte will also be joining us for our next Earth to Humans book club, which you can find more information about at patreon.com slash earth to humans. And as always, let us know what you thought of this episode by leaving us a review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps the show. Charlotte, thank you so much for taking the time joining us on the Earth Humans podcast. Um, I wondered if you could just kind of start, I know you've probably done this a million billion times already, but kind of introduce us to you. Who are you? Where are you from? Um, And I guess, when did you start considering yourself a writer? Sure. Um, Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's a real pleasure. Um, So I've been a a writer for a long time, actually. Um, I started writing my first novel when I was 14, and that kind of turned into about probably a decade of writing um, kind of these really big, sprawling fantasy epics (laughs) for for, um, YA and, and kids. Um, and then I think I reached about, yeah, I reached my mid twenties and was studying screenwriting at the time. So I was learning a lot about cra- the craft of storytelling and, and I went traveling after that and, and just, I don't know, something, something kind of shifted in this type of stories that I wanted to tell. Um, I, maybe it was seeing more of the world, um, that kind of opened my eyes to, all the creatures that we share share it with um, that kind of made me really intrigued and fascinated by them. And then around that time I was also starting to kind of um, become hyper aware of, you know, what's happening to our planet um, and, and the difficulties and the problems that we're kind of going through. And, and it just, I don't know, it just kind of opened up a very different side to my writing and a, and a different sort of passion and, and, and something that I became very interested in. And so that sort of shifted what I was writing about and that's where migrations and then once there were wolves kind of came into this new this new genre. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a Sydney girl in Australia. I've moved around a lot in my lifetime. Um, I've lived in a lot of different places 
Uh, I've always loved stories and always known that that's kind of what I would do with my life. And uh, I'm very lucky that I get to do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and you do it so well. I just got to say again, we're huge fans over here on the podcast. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, going going back to kind of, you know, th- this sort of direction change that you mentioned, going from sort of YA fantasy to kind of these more nuanced stories as they relate to the environment and um, interpersonal sort of demons and um, darkness within people as you know which is all all of this as it relates to the earth and um, species wildlife that kind of thing so you know with with this new direction do you feel like are you trying to stay away from getting branded as sort of like an environmental author or are you interested in other genres or is this kind of the new direction you want to stay in yeah I mean it feels like a good space for me at the moment I like it I feel I mean look the rule for me about what I write is just always to write the book that I want to read and write about the things that I care about and and this just happens to be what I care about at the moment which you know I kind of feel like I'm a bit staggered by people who don't care about it you do Um, it doesn't really make sense to me um so I think for now, this is kind of the the terrain I'll be um, traversing with my writing. I, it's funny. I, I think I already have been branded as a bit of a sort of a cli-fi writer. Cli-fi. <laughs> um, I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole new thing. <laughs> Which um, you know, I have some mixed feelings about that that as a term, as a genre. Um, <laughs> just because I kind of feel like you know, if, if we're not writing about the climate, you can write about climate in any genre. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of important to, I guess, touch on that to, to make, you know, your stories feel authentic and realistic Mm -hmm. because that's what we're going through at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, that is this kind of can't look away disaster that we're in. Um, so it sort of feels funny to me when people relegate it to a, um, you know, a a smaller kind of, uh, speculative genre. Um, (laughs) so anyway, I'm kind of here for climate being talked about in, in everything. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's generally where I'll sit, but I also love lots of different types of stories and I quite like bringing in, um, elements of other genres into my work. Like there's a bit of crime mystery, Mm -hmm. monster wolves, so yeah, um, I, you know, I'm not going to box myself in. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't, I don't want you to be boxed in because whatever, yeah, what the cli-fi or not, it's, it's so, it's so good. But I wonder, you know, as you kind of made that transition, was there, was there sort of one thing as far as climate change or the environment goes that really inspired this path? You know, you, you're from Australia, you guys, and and it sounds like you've been sort of interested in this before you know, the devastating bushfires that you guys had, I think you lost like 40 million acres of land in the most recent one in 2019, 2020, 3 billion animals in, insane, you know, so you kind of got that close to home um, more recently, but was there something that you read about or saw in, you know, in your area that got you on this path? Yeah, it actually was a very specific um, article I remember reading that just kind of changed the whole way I looked at everything. And it, and it was really simple. It just basically said, you know, we're looking at a future without animals. Um, this is kind of what we're barreling towards. These are the stats. These are, you know, we've lost so many of our wild animals just in the last 50 years alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think it's like nearly 80% now. Um, it's insane to me. So that really triggered that whole kind of, uh, I guess, um, it was a bit of an existential crisis. I mean, it was just like how do you kind of comprehend a world where we are the only living creatures? And I know that there's a lot of, you know, the loss of the animals will impact us enormously, but just on a kind of emotional level looking at, what it would feel like to be here alone that I mean that that's the whole basis of my novel Mm -hmm. migrations and Mm -hmm. um I just found that once I had that question in my mind and I couldn't sort of look away from 
the terrible kind of extinction crises and and just I don't know just been really kind of shocked by the apathy of of people we lo- we're losing kind of species every day and I don't know it just feels like nobody seems to care or mm. nobody knows what to do is maybe mm. more of the problem mm-hmm. so yeah I think I can trace it back to that that moment actually mm. and um like kind of before we get into it we're going to be talking about your most recent novel, Once There Were Wolves, but also your previous novel to that, Migrations. And I wonder if you could just kind of, in your own words, give us kind of the low-down synopsis of, of both of those books. Sure. Okay, so I, oh, I'll start with Migrations because I was just mentioning it. So it's the story of Franny Stone, who is an ornithologist who decides to follow the last flock of Arctic terns from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Um, And she does this because she's living in the very near future where during the peak of the extinction crisis, um, when all the animals really are either gone or very close to. Um, And it's kind of the story of her life, um, the the mysteries surrounding what's kind of led her to take on this this enormous, Mm -hmm. very difficult journey. Um, her relationship with her husband, her search for family. Uh, there's, a bit, there's a bit of a crime thing in there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but ultimately it's just kind of a, it's an epic journey of her own redemption and um, trying to kind of reclaim hope where it seems lost. Uh, and then Once There Were Wolves is the story of another kind of fierce female scientist <laughs> <laughs> who is a biologist who's been charged with reintroducing wolves into the Scottish Highlands. And she does that on a kind of rewilding mission to bring the landscape back to life, uh, you, despite the fact that there's a lot of pushback from the locals there who feel that this, this predator being reintroduced is a threat to their, their farming, their mm-hmm. livestock. Um, So she's really kind of up against it and then a body shows up and she's sure that her wolves are going to get blamed Mm -hmm. and so she does a kind of very reckless thing to protect them and and then needs to kind of set out and find the actual killer Mm -hmm. (laughs) to save to save the wolves. I gotta say when um when I did (laughs) <laughs> when I when I did read that part in the story, I was like, au- I audibly gasped. I was like, no way. Okay. <laughs> but it was it was just such a moment. Um, and for me, you know, as someone who works in this field, you can get so consumed, you know, in your sort of little corner of the world with what you're doing, that I empathize with a, a lot of, I guess, her, her thought process in, in the novel. And one of one of the things that really sat with me is the the condition that she has um mirror touch synesthesia where it causes individuals to experience sensations and you know particularly pain um of another person by looking at them um and to me as an extreme empath you know i i really felt that i really felt what inti was experiencing you know when she when she looks at people or looks at animals suffering and kind of kind of can't can't almost even bear it you know and I wonder if you if you saw her extreme I mean I'm categorizing it is a real medical condition um but you know would you kind of categorize that sort of extreme um level of empathy as a sort of disadvantage or um kind of her superpower because sometimes I feel like it's both in my line of work um you know I I do think it is one of the great things about me that allows me to connect with people and the animals that I'm working with, but it's also so hard to be in this fear as you see all the things that are going wrong and all the destruction, devastation, and just how your hard work can not pay off sometimes. So I just wonder, you know, what you think about that as far as empathy goes and sort of big picture, is empathy kind of a a good thing or a bad thing or both? Well, I mean, look, everything that you've been talking about is pretty much the whole thing that I'm exploring in this novel. That idea of is empathy a curse or a gift? Mm. And that's something that Inti really struggles with in this book because she does have such an extreme version of it. And initially, you know, when as a child she kind of views it as this beautiful connecting thing that's um, kind of, you know, almost magical, Mm -hmm. uh, which it does seem almost magical, this amazing condition. 
but as she kind of grows older and and has more experiences of of other people's capacity for harm uh she starts to recognize the vulnerability in being that that empathetic and that connected to people and and i think it just one too many things um push her over the edge and she she kind of is is quite damaged by it and closes herself off to it Mm -hmm. so that's the kind of struggle that we we kind of see her having in this book it's she's instinctively this kind of very uh kind compassionate empathetic person but she's had compassion fatigue Mm -hmm. um you know, it's too much for her to care so much all the time. Mm-hmm. So and 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 to be that exposed to other people's experiences, it is dangerous for her. And so yeah, she's struggling with that in a big way. Um, and I think it's kind of her well, it's her journey throughout the book to sort of reconnect with her ability to to feel that empathy and to feel that kind of love and tenderness towards people and and animals and I mean she's always got it for the animals because Mm -hmm. that's sort of who she is but she's she's really lost her faith in people and and kind of I guess yeah just closed herself off to them and and trying to escape them and and so this is really a story about her reconnecting with 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 that side of herself that can empathize and that's that's brave enough to do so you know I think Mm -hmm. it takes a lot of courage for people who are highly empathetic um to kind of allow themselves to be that vulnerable so Mm -hmm. yeah that's her story and I mean I think ultimately the book is very much about how important empathy is to our world and and you know to be able to empathize with each other with ourselves with the natural world, I think, you know, we would be in a lot less trouble if we were all better able to do that and remembered to do that because that's the other thing. It, you know, you may think that you're not a very empathetic person, but it's a learned skill. People can um, practice. You can practice empathy. You can you can learn it. You can be better at it. You can become more empathetic than you, than you thought that you were. So there's really no excuse. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and kind of... As I finished Once There Are Wolves, I kind of felt like these two books kind of exist in the same universe. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, a little bit, maybe. Maybe, you know, Wolves is kind of actually the prequel mm, <laughs> to mm. my creations. But I, I, there's something kind of terrible about thinking of it that way because then I think that all this, these kind of rewilding efforts that it, that's in Once There Were Wolves mm-hmm. and just have come to nothing mm-hmm. <laughs> if, if, it, if we wind up in a world like Migrations. And I really hope that, that doesn't happen. Right. And, you know, I, I don't know, some, some days I feel really pessimistic about it and other days I feel very optimistic and... Uh, it does it is very heartening to see the work that people like you and um you know these these conservationist characters that I write about and are based on real people um to see the work that they're doing in the world it's you know it's kind of the most important thing we have left Mm -hmm. do you feel like do you think in the universe of migrations that that was the end of it do you think that there was still hope that we could come back from this do you feel like that is our future if we don't act how do you how do you view that that world that you created in migrations uh I do think that's that's the world that we're creating right now um that we will arrive at if we don't do anything and actually I think it'll be a lot worse than Mm. the book Mm. um because I intentionally didn't kind of delve into a lot of the more practical implications of of species extinction so what that would do to our food chain and Mm -hmm. and, um, what the loss of forests would do to our environments and our you know temperatures and (laughs) sea levels and just there's so many implications that I didn't even touch on because I wanted instead to just look at like I said the emotional impact of this idea of the loss of species and and I wanted the world to also look really, really familiar to how mm. it does now. I wanted it to feel like it could be just around the corner that suddenly we'd, we'd lost all these creatures. So I do think that's kind of where we're headed if we don't change. And I and like I said, I think it'll be actually quite worse than that. Um, but I also kind of feel like there's not a lot of point in writing a story like this unless 
it's to write towards hope mm. so mm. and to give some sense of um well hope as an energizer as something that can galvanize us um and give us the energy that we need to kind of take up that fight um I don't know I don't think there's much point in writing a book where you kind of walk away from it and just feel like everything's crap <laughs> like I'm depressed now mm-hmm. and it is a sad book of course but but I, I I hope that I've left it with a kind of a direction at the end and a sense of purpose mm-hmm. um, and without giving away the ending of course I mm-hmm. I did want to leave Franny with that that sense of purpose mm-hmm. because you know, we, you know all's not lost we haven't mm-hmm. lost the battle. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you could kind of talk about you know the sort of the familiarity of the universe that you create in, in these books and how it is sort of in sight. If, you know, if we don't get our shit together, basically, the undercurrent of urgency in both of those books is like we're on the precipice of something really bad. Do you feel that sense of urgency? And are you scared? Like, does it come from that angst and that anxiety that you feel personally? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's the whole thing for me. I, I, I do feel a really big sense of urgency around all of this and I think that's why I kind of am tr- trying to write something that will, I mean, look, I don't know what the impact of these novels is or will be but I think it's important to try to create something that will at least start conversations, mm-hmm. um, at least get people thinking about things Um because sometimes I do feel like a lot of people are not aware of the urgency of this. And I know, you know, the conversation is really opening up now. People, everyone is kind of aware of the urgency, but I think maybe we're not feeling it. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to feel it before we, we're going to be able to kind of change what, what we're doing and act. Mm -hmm. And I think that writing, um, really human stories uh, with intimate connections with characters where we feel what they feel. Um, we feel just very emotionally connected to these characters and these stories is the only way that we're going to be able to, I guess, access our concern or um, access the the fear that we're going to need to move forward Mm -hmm. because I mean I just I just think we tend to kind of close ourselves off to this sort of thing and it's so much easier to be apathetic because it feels too big and too difficult Mm -hmm. um and so writing books that kind of sit on the precipice like I feel that we are now feel like the kind of most powerful way to draw that to mind Mm -hmm. um I mean I I think if I was writing a historical novel well, there's certainly no urgency in a historical mm-hmm. novel. <laughs> there, there, there is some. There is a kind of warning in a future novel, mm-hmm. and there's a ticking clock in a present novel. I think so. Th- that they they felt like the natural spaces really. Um, I didn't have to stretch far either. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't need to kind of make much up for it to feel scary. Mm-hmm. And sort of one thing that I'm learning as, you know, on my journey as an environmentalist, someone who cares deeply about this stuff and, and just the the care and the fatigue in, involved in that is um, we humans are so complicated, right? And we all have our role to play in this. You know, we might not all be, um, you know, molecular biologists or doctors or scientists, you know, if people doing that, I'm, I'm, I'd consider myself an artist. Um, you're an artist and author. So we all kind of have these different roles to play. But I think what's beautiful about your work is, is you are like, okay, I'm a writer. Um, this is what I'm interested in. And I'm going to do what I can as a writer to start these conversations and elevate this to social awareness in my own way, in my own way that no one else has done before with so much empathy, um, with with so much thought and, and that sense of feeling. As you say, like you are really getting readers to feel what this world could feel like without living in that world currently you know we're we're so close to that we can we can you know almost reach out and touch it but we're not quite there for me for me it's the power of stories Mm -hmm. it's you know we've we've always had this 
power throughout history to connect with each other in in this way it's why we tell stories there's something about it that just it just really touches the the deep deepest kind of things within us um and I think as an artist you're always kind of reaching for that those heights and that depth um it's it's that longing for connection that I that is the reason that we write um and I think the same goes for artists making art um musicians making songs um and lots of things in the world as well you know there's there's so many different ways to kind of reach out and connect with each other so I don't think that it's just novels um that are going to kind of change the world but I do think think that art is a way to tap into something um really intimate and emotional that perhaps well we need it as as people and and it enriches our kind of inner worlds and our inner lives and it makes us kind of I suppose feel what it means to be human and mm-hmm. and feel the kind of short breadth of our lives and and give meaning to them in a lot of ways um so if you can also kind of use that that connection or, or, or hope that you're going to connect with people on that level and then use that connection to kind of talk about something that's important to you. Um, I mean, that for me is like the ultimate kind of writing. I know that a lot of people don't have that kind of desire when they write. They want to tell different sorts of stories. They want to connect in different ways. But for me, um, I, I guess I want to use the emotional connection to talk about something mm-hmm. big. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was there um, in, in both of those novels. Um, the the loneliness in migrations, being out to sea on the Sagani, you know, with this crew and just how it, honestly it's one of my biggest fears is just the open ocean, you know, stormy Antarctic seas, no, you know, no one coming to your rescue. Totally scary. And, and and once we learn the motivation behind Franny's almost tunnel vision to complete this task, it's it's just so powerful. Um, and I think a lot of people can see themselves in her actions. Like I didn't feel like her actions were crazy. Like I felt like that that to me made sense on her journey as part of her way of working out the things in her head yeah yeah I mean she's dealing with so much loss and grief um and we all know that that makes people do kind of profoundly Mm -hmm. life-changing things really Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you kind of (laughs) felt (laughs) believed her motivations and didn't you know there are definitely readers who find her quite difficult to stomach Mm. um and 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 just sort of I guess don't can't can't relate to her mm-hmm. behavior mm-hmm. um and and that's also interesting to me you know I I think well you never no character is ever going to connect with every single reader mm-hmm. but um I think there's something interesting to be explored in why you know people don't kind of relate to what she's doing or, mm-hmm. or who she is or where mm-hmm. she's come from um I want to now kind of move a little bit to wolves a bit were you interested in in wolves as a subject matter? Uh, like, how did you kind of build the story for that? Did it start with wolves? Did it start with Inti's character? Did it start with Scotland? Like, where did that kind of? It started when I read an article about Pando, the trembling giant, which is a um, a forest of quaking aspen trees in Utah. Mm-hmm. Uh, except that it's not actually a forest; it's one giant. Um, organism which is connected by a root system under the earth and all the trees are actually identical shoots of this one organism and it's the biggest living organism we have on the earth and the oldest potentially Um, and a lot of scientists kind of put it at it could potentially be a million years old so it's this kind of extraordinary strange beautiful thing uh, which is dying due to human impact Um, and the perfect way to save it would be to reintroduce wolves to the forest or a predator, but specifically wolves to 
move along the herbivore population, which are eating it to death and not allowing it to grow. But the article said that that wasn't going to happen because the locals basically wouldn't kind of abide that. Um, there was, there's too much focus on farming and hunting in that area. So it just, I don't know, something happened. It was like an entire book just came to life in my mind as I read this article. I knew that I needed to tell the story of a woman who was going to do this, who's going to try and bring back the wolves to the save this forest, um, despite the fact that nobody wanted her there and nobody wanted her to be doing it. And I kind of went for a walk and I pulled in all these little things that I'd been sort of interested in. So I, I was interested in twins. So I was like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to make her a twin. I, I knew that I wanted to write a story about someone with mirror touch synesthesia. So I was like, okay, it's Inti. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's perfect for her because there's going to be a story about empathy, mm-hmm. um, connection. You know, it's perfect to have a character that's all about kind of empathy and lack of empathy and et cetera. And I knew that I wanted I, you know, the, the crime came in straight away. I knew that there was going to be a body and that she would have to kind of, uh, it would look like the wolves, but would it be the wolves or not? It, and it was just like I got home from this walk and the whole thing was just there and it was so strange because normally my ideas just they're like getting blood out of a stone. They mm-hmm. take forever mm-hmm. and I'm kind of building them and moulding them and picking them apart for ages and the, the characters take a long time to sort of calm. And I mean, maybe I'm just saying that because that's what's happening with my current <laughs> <laughs> book. <laughs> but anyway, this Wolves was totally different. It was just this amazing kind of fully formed thing. And, of course, you know, it was difficult to then write it and I sort of realised, oh, my God, I don't know anything about wolves. I don't know anything about, you know, working with wolves, using them to rewild. I don't know anything about being a biologist. <laughs> like, why have I done this to myself? But I just <laughs> kind of set out and did a heap of reading. Um, the research for this book obviously mm-hmm. was massive um, before I could even kind of start it, but it was just great to have that sort of that basic plot line there really. Um, and, and initially it was set in Utah, but I kind of um, – it didn't feel quite right to me. I've never been there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a place that I know, which didn't feel like the right thing for me to write about, whereas I have a bit more of a connection with Scotland. Um, I have Scottish heritage. I've been there. Um, and it felt like the right kind of mm, aesthetic and mood for this sort of story, mm-hmm. you know, those sort of kind of beautiful, bleak, uh, mm-hmm. wintry mountains. And, mm-hmm. and they're actually dealing with... Uh, or, or, you know, discussing this exact topic of whether or not they should reintroduce wolves. Yeah, yeah. Scotland seemed to be sort of the perfect setting for this because you do have that history of eradication and removal for the sake of agriculture um, and sort of this longstanding attitude towards predators. I think, um, you you know, Ireland's kind of the same way. Um, It's just, it's all, you know, very similar where I think that the biggest predator they've got in some of these places are like foxes or, you know, and that's kind of it. And you've eradicated some of these beautiful predators that used to be on this landscape and used to be part of the the healthy aspects of this landscape and, and how our vision of what, you know, these places look like, Scotland, rolling hills, um, sheep and slow living agriculture, it's beautiful, but that is not what the landscape is supposed to look like, you know, and I think it, it's just, it, it's, I felt like it was the perfect place to kind of convey that. Um, you know, we kind of talked about your, your interest in sort of some of these environmental issues, but there is this thread of sort of human wildlife or, or human conservationist conflict, kind of going back to when I mentioned, you know, your portrayal of a working biologist dealing with these people, be it Franny working with these fishermen who hate her and, you know, what she stands for is trying to save the turns and therefore saving the fish. Um, or NT trying to reintroduce wolves into a place that doesn't want them. Where does where does that sort of interest come from? Look, conflict is kind of the uh, cornerstone of any story. So that's what you look for when you come up with an idea. You think, all right, well, if this person is trying to do this, who's trying to stop her and why? And so that's the kind of basis for 
my research. Um, and I looked a lot at um, specific projects like the Yellowstone rewilding project, um, the reintroduction of the wolves there in the 90s. Um, and it, it just taught me so much about what they were up against at the time and, and this really huge conflict that came out of it. Um, I was kind of shocked because I think it, it didn't really occur to me that it would be a bad thing to bring animals back to a space, you know, it's sort of, I mean, that seems like a no-brainer to me, but then mm-hmm. once I started learning about the impact of that and, and what that would actually do to the communities around there, I sort of thought, okay, this is a lot more complex than, than you know, it's it's not one-sided. There are valid points of view on both sides and, mm-hmm. and obviously I'm hugely on the side of the conservation and the rewilding <laughs> and, the, and the animals. But uh, that's not to say that I have um, apathy or a disinterest in the other side of things either. My dad is a is a cattle and sheep farmer. So he I kind of grew up um, knowing about the difficulties of that and the mm-hmm. immense financial pressure that lands on people in that position, um, what they kind of go through and and the idea to them of, bringing in a predator that could make their lives harder is mm. is sort of i mean that's a that's a betrayal from their government and from mm. they're, they're being let down as, as they view it so i mean there's, there's it's just an interesting space to mine um and it's kind of the space that i guess we need to make sense of moving forward to be able to do any of this stuff Mm -hmm. Um, we need to acknowledge the burden that falls on people in in rural places um, when it comes to rewilding and we need to I guess help to ease that burden Mm -hmm. in order to be able to do this um, moving forward and yeah I I I don't know I, I guess I just tried to put myself in in these in these situations and, and and read a lot about it to kind of figure out okay what are the what are the opinions and and I was actually shocked at, at kind of how hard it was to get that Yellowstone project through and mm. and and the you know the the protests and the defiance mm. and the rage that it kind of brought up in people and you know otherwise really calm kind of reasonable people were, were having these kind of immense feelings around around wolves and and the same on the other side you know calm people were kind of feeling very passionately pro wolves it's just mm-hmm. this kind of amazing thing and I don't know it just yeah it felt like a great great space for a story yeah and, and you do that dance with those nuances so beautifully um I think a lot of people um tend not to look at those nuances because it is so easy to just demonize or vilify you know the opposition um that's something that I've kind of come to learn in my work is more than dealing with wildlife. I'm dealing with people and I have to be able to communicate with people. Otherwise I'm not going to be successful. We're not going to be successful. Yeah, that's right. There's kind of no point in, in, I mean, we've got to be talking about it in terms of togetherness now rather than division. Mm -hmm. So, and cooperation is kind of like, yeah, the the only way forward. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you're so right. Yeah. This thread of violence in wolves, the importance of inserting that in the novel, um, violence against women specifically, and sort of your thought process as it related to the, 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 the bigger picture of the book. Okay, so I mentioned that I had this kind of story about about wolves and about a woman and I felt very strongly that it was the kind of right space for me to be writing in because I, you know, I, I'm I'm very passionate about um, our natural world. I'm also very passionate about the crisis that we're going through, um, very much so in Australia, but globally, with male violence against women. Uh, here in Australia, we have a woman getting murdered by her partner every week, um, and that's not including all the women who survive their abuse. Mm -hmm. It's just a really shocking kind of epidemic. Mm -hmm. And at the time when I was kind of dealing with this story and that was very kind of present in my mind as well at the time of of something that I felt very strongly about and, and, 
And I, I remember grappling with how they could be part of the same story and, and how that would sort of work and did that work. And, you know, I, I wanted to write about these two things that I felt so strongly about but I didn't know how to do it. And then it kind of twigged for me that actually they both kind of boil down to empathy and a lack of empathy and what it, what it causes people to become and do. And so it kind of suddenly worked for me then that this this needed to be a story about the harm that we're capable of doing to each other and to our animals and to our wild spaces and this sort of um, cruelty that we're capable of and, and why and where it comes from and, and how do we combat that? What do we use to fight cruelty? And, and it just... It seemed very obvious to me that it was the tenderness and love mm. is is the only way to fight cruelty, um, and that seemed something that it just felt like an important thing to be able to 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 witness that love and that tenderness in the wolves and use that as um, something that was very that could inspire us and our behaviour. Mm-hmm. You know, I was really shocked that that when I was doing my wolf research that they are so not what we think they are you know they're they're these really shy gentle family oriented creatures and and when you look at their kind of individual stories and personalities you get this overwhelming sense of love for each other of courage you know just it's just extraordinary and I just found that really kind of just a really powerful way to sort of think about all right well how are we going to take this inspiration from nature and use it in our own relationships and in our own kind of interactions. Mm -hmm. And will that make the world a better place? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, especially as it relates to what you were, what you just mentioned, the sort of the surprising things that you learned about wolves in your research. It's just funny to me how these things that are considered quote unquote feminine characteristics with anything, you know, um, tenderness, uh, cooperation, community. We we just did a really interesting podcast episode recently about petro-masculinity, basically this idea of climate change being driven by masculine traits, sort of like this need to conquer, this need to this need for more, this need to take. Um, I wonder if if you find any parallels between the way that we treat the earth um, and, you know, the earth is talked about as mother, as feminine, and the, the way that we treat women um, in society. I mean, definitely. The, the, that for me kind of felt like such a simple metaphor, really. You know, it, it felt really true. Um, I think to me it seems that the kind of violence that a woman is capable of and the kind of violence that a wolf is capable of or a wild creature is very similar. Mm. It's not the same as the kind of violence that a man is capable of. Mm. I don't know why that is. I guess it's this, you know, it's a it's a toxic patriarchal society that we grow up in and it feeds a lot of anger. And I think that this... this <sighs> I don't know, look, I'm making very broad statements here and, and I don't want to kind of offend anyone, but I do feel like that 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 violence that we see women and animals commit is about survival. Mm. When we see male men commit violence against women, it's not about survival, it's about possession mm. and rage. Um, and those two things are really, really different spaces. Um, and, and I, yeah, that that to me felt like something kind of, interesting to 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 unpick a little bit Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. you know for Inti her the violence that she commits is sort of I think more in line with the wolves Mm -hmm. um, than than the violence that we see them some of the male characters commit but there's also a male character who's incredibly gentle and kind and you know it's I think it's important to not just define these traits as gender specific Mm -hmm. but but as you say um maybe the masculine side of things and the feminine side of things are a, a way that we can kind of more easily delineate. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I appreciate your candor. I mean, it, it's such a hard 
like these conversations, I'm glad that we're having them. I think they are sparked in the novel, um, but they're really hard to have because it doesn't feel like there's any right answer. I mean, yeah, look, I wish I knew the answers to all of this. I, I really don't. And I, I think this is part of the problem. There's not a simple answer to how we're going to manage this. Um, it's complex and confusing and there's a lot of kind of different thought processes and fundamentally for me it comes down to needing the people in power to to act and to to do this for us because you know they have the power <laughs> it's just so frustrating i we need to be voting the right people in and you guys did a great job getting rid of trump my god <laughs> um. <laughs> i've, I've to, to be honest haven't heard so much about Australian politics, but I do know that it is kind of headed into a more conservative male. It's really right-wing. Male... It's, yes, yeah, it's, really it's right very right-wing, right-wing at the moment and it's a real problem because there is no focus being put on climate change or on um, saving anything. And we've got a really bad rate of like degradation. We are just deforesting like there's no, you know, it, it's really, really bad. We're losing more species than anywhere else in the world. Um, and our government just doesn't care. You know, they're not phasing out coal. They're not. Um, they're not switching to renewables. It's just. It's kind of um, soul destroying, actually. Um, and anyway, we're really <laughs> hoping that the next election will kind of bring something new. But I, yeah, I, I, like I said, I don't know how else to kind of fight this except mm-hmm. to vote the right people into power because it's very difficult for kind of the most of us to have any larger impacts most of this um, problem is being done by major corporations and um you know we can't fight those that being said there's incredible work that's happening like you said because our governments aren't supporting us there's people that are really stepping up and fighting and 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 doing extraordinary um, work towards this, you know, saving this planet. But I, I yeah, I just I'm s i am do not have any any answers, I'm afraid. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that that's what I struggle with all the time. And 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 it's it's that kind of unanswerable question. I I, I wish I could answer the questions in my books, but I I don't know how to. Well, I don't I don't know if there is an answer. And you know, when I, I think you do challenge some of those questions that we just mentioned in both of the novels, you know, it it's definitely at the forefront there. Um and I think the more people try to make a change and to make a difference, the the better it will be. You yeah. can't all just think that there's no there's no way forward, you know, yeah. we've got to all <laughs> do our part. There's this <laughs> this push that I try to do for people that kind of navigate this this sphere of despair, loss, um, pain, um, this need for self care, right? Like individuals have to, we have like activists, we have to take care of ourselves because there is so much despair. And if we are to keep pushing and and creating thought provoking work like you are doing, um, we have to kind of take a step back away. Is is writing self-care for you you know is is kind of immersing yourself in these worlds therapeutic is it frustrating is it like an outlet or do you do something completely different is it you know, trash television is my favorite way to kind of escape what do you do to kind of navigate self-care yeah writing is definitely all of the above for me I have um moments where it's so uh so fulfilling and so kind of important for I guess the way I exist in this world um it can also be really hard and really exhausting and just kind of challenge me to go to places that as you say become quite draining and yeah then I do need to step away and so so it's this weird kind of balancing act sometimes it's my self-care and then sometimes I need to self-care because of it um, I love TV. I love watching TV. <laughs> uh, I love reading. Um, I guess just being able to kind of 
Yeah, I yeah, no, I, I do actually need to watch crappy TV sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I got you to admit it. Totally. I mean, I love watching great TV, but I also love to just be able to switch yeah. off and kind of go, oh, yes. don't think about anything serious. Don't yes. think about the world ending. <laughs> um, I just kind of wrapping up a little bit, you are a mother. And we on the show have talked a lot about how how do we talk to kids about climate change and how do we talk to kids about sort of like the state of things without just scaring the crap out of them. I wonder how, you know, as you're kind of spending a lot of time in this sphere of thought, thinking about the state of the world, the planet, the bleak future that's potentially ahead of us, but also as a mother, how you are navigating that. I'm just really curious. Well, I have a natural inclination towards total honesty. Um, and just first of all, I should say my son is only five months old. <laughs> You're definitely not comprehending anything about <laughs> climate change yet. Um, but like I've got friends with kids and and I remember talking to one of them asked me at one point, are we going to die from climate change? Mm. <laughs> and I remember I had to really check myself mm. to not just be like, well, maybe, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I, my instinct is to kind of go into explaining everything about it all. And I sort of realized that his parents would not have appreciated that. <laughs> um, they're a lot more <laughs> protective, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, that is something that I'm going to have to figure out for myself how far I kind of uh, let him into the, <laughs> well, you know, how yeah. far I open Pandora's box. And, yeah. and actually this is kind of something that I'm exploring in my new novel, which I'm working on at the moment, what what the, I, I guess, that idea of raising children in a dying world and our responsibilities around that and how we do that. And, you know, we've got to kind of raise this generation to be, better than we are Mm -hmm. um but it's also you know it's really crummy to just sort of dump all of the bad stuff that we've done on them and say that you know let it be on your shoulders to Mm -hmm. fix this I don't we don't want to do that but we need them I guess to be courageous and forward thinking and um and I think they will be you know I, I I don't think they being born into a world that's in crisis I don't think they could you know could not be but I yeah I think about it all the time I, my partner's very kind of um proactive about okay what kind of world do we want to leave to our son um well you know I don't want to leave a world that's got plastic all in the friggin creek so let's just go pick up all the plastic in the creek when we walk past it you know just little things like that um do we want to leave a world that relies on, um, you know, fossil fuels? No. So let's transition our house out of having a gas stove. Just things like that, like trying to think forward, far ahead, um, how we can kind of set things up for him as best we can. But I, I will be. I'm going to be honest with him. I, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to not be. Wow. Well, I, I appreciate this conversation, Charlotte. It's It's been such a pleasure once there were wolves is out and folks can go purchase it at your local bookshop or online. Um, anything you can tell us about the next book besides what you've already mentioned, when will it be out? No pressure. Um, but we're all very excited. I don't know when it's going to be out cause I'm still writing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, uh, set on a sub Antarctic Island and it's about, a man and his three children living on this island as caretakers. The oceans are rising really swiftly and they're Mm. getting trapped. Um, And a woman washes up on shore and they don't know where she's come from or who she is and there's a bit of kind of mystery and intrigue around that and um, it'll be about whales and seals and seabirds and... (laughs) Um, you know, lots of kind of beautiful wildlife and about ocean currents that are changing because of melting ice. And it'll be about raising children, like I said, and, and what we need to do around that and, and, and raising kids that aren't ours. And um, yeah, just kind of, I guess it'll be, I'm, I'm sort of looking at it as maybe, you know, a, tr- a, a third in a trilogy and yeah, of a sort of, you know, thematically speaking. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Um, and any any books in all of your massive free time that I'm sure you have with a five-month-old, any um, books that you've read recently that you really liked? 
Oh, um, I read Night Bitch recently, which I really enjoyed. It's a, um, it's kind of this funny, slightly tongue in cheek um, look at motherhood. Mm. <laughs> uh, so it was, you know, it's apt for where I'm at right now, and, and it's about a mother who is. Um, you know, she's so sleep deprived that she's kind of turning into a wild animal at night. Mm. <laughs> so I, I quite like, I, I enjoyed that. Um, I, I can recommend that one. Awesome. Charlotte, thank you so much for your time um, and for coming onto the show. We really appreciate it and uh, really looking forward to the next novel. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. Earth to Humans is a production of the Wildlands Collective. It's produced every other week by Serena Simons, Matt Podolsky, and Hannah Mulvaney. Our intro sequence was edited by Matt Podolsky with shouting assistance from the Foothill School of Arts and Sciences kindergarten class. Nozomi Takayabu makes original artwork for each episode of the show, which you can find at wildlandsinc.org eth, as well as photos of Charlotte and links to the books. And if you haven't already, leave us an honest rating and review. It really helps other folks find the show. If you liked what you heard and want to support the work that we do, consider joining our Patreon campaign for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash earth to humans. We're also on Instagram at earth to humans pod. Audio samples used in the intro sequence were provided by the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And today's music is by Blue Dot Sessions. Thank you.